Okay, so for a course like this one, where we're trying, I'm, I'm trying to give you sort of like a broad understanding of, uh, of mathematics, sort of a broad view of, of what math is, I figured a good place to start would be to start with a discussion of what is math, right? What is mathematics? And this is a topic that we'll come back to throughout the semester. Um, it's uh, something that uh, we'll have better answers for, I think, later on in the course. But, uh, but to begin with, I think uh, when we think of math, oftentimes we, we think about numbers, right? Numbers is kind of like an obvious place to start when you're, talk, when you're you know, talking about a discussion of, of what math is. And so, um, but when you think about numbers, there are all kinds of questions about numbers that, that sort of spring up in terms of like, they're like just philosophically speaking. Like, like so, so some questions that I'd like to talk to you about today and, and consider with you, and actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to link to some videos um, for you to watch, but I just wanted to give you kind of a brief introduction to some of these ideas. But, um, but some questions to consider. You know, would math exist if people didn't, right? Uh, do extraterrestrials have math if you believe in aliens, right? Do they, do they have math? Uh, and, you know, if so, are their mathematical facts the same as ours? Like, do they have the Pythagorean theorem, for example? Obviously, they wouldn't call it that, but, but do they have, you know, the, the Pythagorean theorem? Um, other questions, you know, how do we know about numbers? You know, we, we, we don't smell them or taste them, right? So, it's like, how do we know about them? Um, are numbers, polygons, equations, etc., are these truly real objects? Are they real things? Or are they, or are they merely ethereal representations of some theoretical ideal? Okay, uh, so, and then another related question is, is math discovered or is it invented? Is it something we make up or is it something that we find? Okay, so, um, I'm going to disappoint you and say I don't have good answers to any of these questions. <laughs> um, but one thing that you'll one thing that you'll see in the videos that I link to are some possible uh, answers that people have come up with um, through the through the ages. So uh, anyway, um, so to give you some background, uh, some more I guess motivation for where these kinds of questions are coming from. Okay, so so how do we know about numbers? Well. Most of the things that we know are learned through some kind of causal interaction, right? We smell something, we see something, we feel something, and that's how we learn about it, right? But you can't do that with numbers. So, so how do we know about numbers, right? Nobody's ever tripped over the number two in the street, right? You can't smell the number seven. So I think the place that most people kind of naturally go to in their minds is that, well, you know, uh, then they must just be inventions, right? They, they must just be inventions of the human mind. But that doesn't quite feel right, because that would put numbers in the same category as any work of fiction, like Sherlock Holmes, right? So, uh, and that's just kind of strange. It, it doesn't seem like that's the case with numbers, that they're just purely inventions in the same way that Sherlock Holmes was an invention of Arthur Conan Doyle, right? Because because it doesn't. Because we know that Arthur Conan Doyle sat down and wrote Sherlock Holmes, right? But it doesn't seem like anybody invented the number seven. There's always been the number seven. And and besides that, we can imagine a time when seven things existed, even though there were no humans around to count them, right? So so back in the dinosaur times, I'm sure there was a, a time when there were you know uh, seven. I don't know velociraptors running around some prairie somewhere or whatever right uh so we can imagine there being you know seven themes there even though there are no humans to count them so it doesn't seem like seven is just an invention of the human mind in the same way that you know something like Sherlock Holmes is so so then are, are numbers real right uh are they I, I don't know and what are they what are what are numbers right and how do we know about them? Well, there there are a few different uh, possible answers out there, and um, I'm just going to talk about one of them called Platonism, uh, named after the Greek uh, philosopher Plato. And um, I'm not highlighting this because I think it's the best answer or because I think it's correct or anything like that, 
but in the videos, uh, a lot of the videos are going to reference Platonism, and um, and I think it, it's good for you to have some background on what Platonism is, so that you understand. I think you know what's in the videos a little bit better. But okay, so Plato believed that all things, you know, trees, the color purple, the concept of justice, etc., right, all things have an ideal form that physically exists. Uh, in what he called the world of forms. So the world of forms is a real place filled with real things that are, you know, the ideal forms of all of these things that we sort of see shadows of in in, in our world, or like or, or or like bad copies of in our world. But this world of forms, e even though it's a real place, it, it you could kind of think that like it exists in another in another dimension. So so we can't like actually interact with it. Now. That, that kind of seems wacky at first, right? <laughs> You're like, where in the world is this guy coming from? Like, why does he believe this? What, what leads him to believe this? But, but here's what he was getting at, right? So, so Plato realized that, you know, no two trees are exactly the same, even if they're the same species of tree. They're, no two trees are the same. And yet, when we see a tree, we recognize that it's a tree, right? So if you see two pine trees, they're not going to be exactly the same tree, but you can look at them both and you can recognize that they're trees. And what's even more impressive is that you could look at a pine tree and you can look at a sycamore tree and those two trees look entirely different. They look completely different, but you can look at them and you can recognize that they're both trees, right? And uh, you, you could say something similar about, you know, the color purple, the concept of justice, and so forth. So Plato thought, uh, that must mean that we're we must be born with some innate knowledge of the world of forms, right? The, so so there must be this this place where uh, there's sort of like a template or a blueprint uh, uh, for all of these things that exist in our world, and and we must be born with some innate knowledge of that. We must be born with some innate knowledge of uh, of you know what the ideal tree is, what what the ideal color purple is, or whatever, right? And that's why we're able to recognize. Uh, for example, that trees are trees. So, so this is the idea of Platonism. And uh, so, to Plato, uh, the the way that this would uh, apply to numbers is that to Plato, you know, the number seven definitely exists. It's a real physical object, um, but it exists in the world of forms. So we don't interact with it, right? So it's something that exists. It, it has a real physical existence, but but that real physical existence is something that we uh, are sort of separated from. But we know about it. We know about the number seven because we're born with an innate knowledge of the world of forms, right? So this was Plato's kind of idea. Uh, and that's Platonism in general. Uh, again, this is not the only answer to like what are numbers and how do we know about them. Uh, uh, but it is an answer that, uh, that will be discussed in the videos. And so I just wanted to give you some more background on it. <clears throat> uh, another approach to this kind of idea, uh, right, are numbers real or, or not, right? It, it, uh, another way to kind of ask a similar kind of question is this. What are we studying when we study math, right? What is math the study of? Right, so geology is the study of the earth. It's the study of, you know, the minerals, the rocks, uh, the various uh, processes by which mountains are formed and things like this, right? Uh, so geology is the study of the earth. Biology is the study of life. It's the study of uh, the way that organisms reproduce, the way that uh, the, their various phases of life, the uh, uh, their behaviors, right? So, so biology is the study of uh, of life. Physics is the study of matter, motion, and energy. Mathematics is the study of mathematics <laughs> right it's like it's it's almost circular in a way it's like it's just, it's just mathematics is the study of itself i guess right uh I, again i think a natural place that we jump to is that oh well, math is the study of numbers but it's not just the study of numbers um uh for example graph theory which is something that we'll look at in this class a little bit later on in the class graph theory is just about points and lines. Uh, there are no numbers involved, really. You can assign numbers to, to points and lines and, and things like that on your graphs, but, uh, uh, but, but that's not to say that uh, uh, 
but just because you you can assign a number to something doesn't make it mathematics, right? Uh, for example, in physics, you can assign numbers to all kinds of things, but physics isn't necessarily mathematics. So, so, um, so anyway, so math it, it's not just the study of numbers. But but stepping back for a second, let's just say, well, even if it were the study of numbers, even if math were just the study of numbers, what even are numbers, right? What are these things that we're that we're talking about? What are numbers? And and to see what I'm getting at. Uh, try to define the word number without using the word number in the definition or, or some equivalent like quantity or whatever, right? Just try to define the word number without using the word number in the definition. Uh, it, it's, it's more difficult to do than, than you might think. So, so what is math? What, right? what is math the study of? Again, I don't really have any good answers here, uh, but these are questions that uh, people have considered. Uh, for centuries, as they've as they've considered, uh, you know, the philosophy of mathematics. Um, a couple things that I, uh, a couple terms that I'll use a lot that I I just want you to be sort of vaguely familiar with um, are pure math and applied math. So uh, so there are lots of different ways that you can sort of categorize uh, the various branches of mathematics, but but this is one way to sort of do so very broadly. So applied math is math that is done, whether you think it's invented or discovered or whatever, but it's math that's done with the intention of its being used in some other field, like physics or computer science or finance or whatever, right? So applied math is something that's done with an application in mind. Pure math, on the other hand, is math that's done with no thought to its applicability. It's just math that's done uh, for the sake of the math. Uh, pure math is just... It's puzzles that people do because they like doing puzzles, basically. Okay, so pure math and applied math. Um, <clears throat> so now, uh, so now we can consider this question: Is is math discovered or invented? Well, if it's a real thing, whether in Plato's world of forms or otherwise, um, then mathematicians discover mathematical facts. If, on the other hand, it's just something that humans make up, then it's a, then math is something that's invented. Now, when you're dealing with applied math, it, it certainly seems like math was just a tool that people invented to make sense of the world, right? Numbers were invented because we needed to count sheep, right? Calculus was invented to help us do physics. Of course, we've already seen kind of the caveat behind this reasoning, right? Numbers were invented because we needed to count sheep, and yet, at the same time, it doesn't feel like anybody came along and, and, and ever invented the number seven. It seems like it always existed, right? So, uh, so on the one hand, it seems like yes, these are calculus is just an invention. On the other hand, it seems like well, maybe calculus did exist and we discovered it instead, right? So at first glance, it seems like you know an invention, but then when you start to dig in and think about it a little more, maybe it was a discovery of something that actually has some kind of real existence outside of the human mind. When dealing with pure math. It also seems like math is invented at first glance, but again, when you start to think about it a little more, uh, uh, it doesn't it doesn't quite work out, right? So, so pure math is kind of like a game. You invent a set of rules, uh, which we usually call axioms or definitions, right? But you invent a set of rules, and then you discover where those rules lead you. So, so right off the bat, like when dealing with pure math, it, it really kind of seems like a mixture between invention and discovery. Um, you're, you're inventing the rules, but then you discover where they lead you. Uh, however, pure math oftentimes ha it ends up having these really crazy, uh, unlooked-for, real-world applications. Um, and in fact, there was a, a famous physicist actually named Eugene Wigner, and he called this the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics, right? Uh, and the idea is that, you know, if, if pure math is just a game, right, it's just a game that's the, with a random set of rules that we just invented, right? Uh, if that's all just a fiction, then why does it work so well, even for what it wasn't invented to do, right? Why is it so effective, uh, right? This is the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. And so that kind of makes it seem like, well, then it... It, maybe it wasn't an invention after all. Maybe it, it maybe it's a real thing that exists independent of the human mind, and, and we just invented it when, when we sort of made up the game. We weren't inventing the game; we were discovering the game. <clears throat> um, so 
I want to uh, end by giving you three examples of this, uh, of this unreasonable effectiveness in mathematics. And these examples will be in some of the videos that I, uh, that I link to as well. Um, but, uh, but I wanted to give you maybe a little bit more background. So, so one example, uh, a British mathematician, G.H. Hardy, he, uh, he actually boasted, he, he said something, I don't remember the exact quote, but he said something along the lines of like, I defy, I defy anybody to show me when, you know, how, how my work will ever be useful in any other field. Like he didn't, he did not think that his work in mathematics would ever be useful anywhere. And he was actually proud of that, right? So he boasted that his work in, in number theory, number theory is a, a, a branch of mathematics, but, but he boasted that it would never be useful anywhere else, right? Well, a century later, uh, his work is foundational for cryptography, right? So for encryption, decryption, right? Uh, the, the work that he did in number theory, absolutely essential for that. So, uh, uh, so that's, kind of, that, that's kind of a humorous example. Um, another example, non-Euclidean geometry. So this is kind of a, a fascinating story. But Euclid uh, was a Greek mathematician, ancient Greek mathematician, and he is famous for ta basically taking geometry and boiling it down to these five axioms that I've written out here. Okay, um, And uh, so the axioms are statements that we just take to be true. Right. So so Euclid said, well, if you just take it on faith that these five statements are true, then all the rest of geometry can be proven from these axioms. Right. So, for example, uh, it, you know, uh, from these axioms, I can prove that the three angles of a triangle add up to be 180 degrees. Right. I can prove that, uh, you know, if you have a right triangle with legs A and B and hypotenuse C, that a squared plus b squared is going to equal c squared, right? Like, like I can prove these things just from these five axioms. And, um, and so that was Euclidean geometry. However, notice that I put a bunch of question marks uh, at the end of this fifth one. This last axiom is called the parallel postulate. And for a long time, mathematicians thought that actually you didn't need to assume this. They thought that maybe you could prove this just just from the first four axioms. So you take the first four axioms and then you're able to prove the fifth one. And, um, and so this was an open question in mathematics for literally thousands of years. Uh, <clears throat> and long story short, very long story short, what they found out is that actually uh, you do need to assume this fifth uh, axiom because if you don't, then you get all kinds of other geometries that are perfectly consistent. They are self-consistent. Uh, so, so basically, what what what, pe what people did is it, when they were trying to prove that you could when when they were trying to prove the fifth axiom, what they would do is they would assume the first four axioms were true. And then they would assume the opposite of this last axiom, and then they would try to show that that would that that you would get some kind of contradiction if you did that. Uh, but they failed, right? They failed, and what what they found is that actually uh, you get perfectly valid, perfectly consistent geometries. Now it is kind of a weird concept, right? Right? Like if you have parallel lines, of course they're never going to intersect, right? It, it seems at first glance, uh, like of course that's true. And yet, when you think about a sphere, think about the li the lines of uh, longitude on a globe, right? They all meet at the north and south poles. So there, you have these parallel lines all along that sphere, but they do meet, they intersect, right? Um, so, uh, so you get non-Euclidean geometries. You get things like spherical geometry or hyperbolic geometry. And these things, at first glance, seem nonsensical. Like, how could, a parallel, how could two parallel lines ever intersect? But then you have, but then there are real-world applications for it. Uh, hyperbolic geometry is, is very useful for understanding the way that celestial bodies move, right? Comets and, and things. Um, just understanding gravity in general. So, uh, so yeah. So non-Euclidean geometry. So, so another example of this sort of game that we set up, where we imagined something that seemed absolutely ridiculous. Uh, found out that it wasn't ridiculous, and then later on found applications for it, right? So it's, it's unreasonable how effective it is. 
Um, and then the last example I'll give you is, is not theory. And I actually did some research in not theory as an undergraduate student. So, uh, so this is one that's kind of near and dear to my heart. But uh, in mathematics, a knot, you, you can think of it like if you take a string and then you tie a knot in the string, any knot that you like, but you tie a knot in the string and then you fuse the ends together so that you can't undo the knot. That's, that's what a mathematical knot is. Well, uh, Lord Kelvin believed that atoms were actually just, well, first of all, at that time, physicists believed that there was this ether that sort of permeated all space, right? And Lord Kelvin thought that that atoms were just knots in the ether. And so it became very important to physicists to be able to classify all of the different kinds of knots. Uh, it didn't take very long for physicists to figure out that actually that wasn't the nature of the universe, right? That atoms are not knots in the ether. But by the time physicists had realized that, mathematicians had taken this problem and run with it. And, and that's how you get knot theory. So knot theory is all about you know, trying to tell different knots apart from one another and that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, so at, at that point, knot theory was completely useless. It was like the, there was no reason to continue doing knot theory, but mathematicians just did it because they liked the puzzle. Right? So it's just this pure math thing. Well, uh, again, you know, century, uh, century later, uh, we're now using knot theory to do things like uh, to understand how proteins tangle themselves and, and DNA strands, right? Tangle and untangle themselves. So, uh, so mathematics is, is just, it's, it's, it has this unreasonable effectiveness that makes it seem like it must be this real thing that actually exists, uh, and that's not just the the product of the human brain. Um, so so who knows, right? It's like on, on the one hand, you you don't smell it, you don't trip over it, right? Uh, you can't hear it, you can't hear the number seven, but on the other hand, uh, the, the mathematics is so unreasonably effective that it just seems like it's got to be real. So. Uh, so anyway, so that's that. Uh, that's all I have to say, and um, and, and then I'll post some more videos for you to kind of think about this as your first introductory, uh, uh, kind of your first introduction to the class, I suppose. I, I don't anticipate that most lectures will go this way. Uh, for for the most part, I think they'll be more like traditionally math, but 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 this is just a fun. Um, discussion, I think, to start the semester on. So that's that.